One of the most astonishing aspects of the animated series Primal, created by the talented Gendy Tartakovsky, is the introduction of a disease that is as devastating as it is mysterious, the Plague of Madness. Throughout an episode that is both brutal and shocking, we witness the transformation of seemingly harmless herbivorous dinosaurs into ferocious, bloodthirsty monsters that destroy everything in their path. In this video, we will thoroughly analyze what the Plague of Madness is, how it is portrayed in the series, why it is so lethal, its possible origins, and the various theories that have emerged around it. Finally, we will reflect on its significance, its implications within the world of Primal, and why it has become one of the most talked about and acclaimed episodes of the series. To begin, we must remember that Primal is an animated series set in a fictional prehistoric world where, in an anachronistic mix, dinosaurs, mammals, hominids, and various other creatures, including supernatural elements, coexist. This combination creates a hostile, violent environment filled with surprises that the audience would never expect from what might initially seem like a simple setting. The seventh episode, titled Plague of Madness, stands out due to its horror atmosphere, its level of brutality, and, most notably, the mystery surrounding the origin and nature of the plague. In this episode, we see a group of sauropod dinosaurs, specifically Argentinosaurus, being brutally attacked and slaughtered by one of their own, a male of the same species who has been infected after being bitten by an unusually aggressive hadrosaur. With this premise, the episode unfolds in a series of scenes that left me both intrigued and unsettled. The infection spreads extremely fast in the sauropod, and as a result, the dinosaur begins behaving as if it has lost all sense of will, transforming into what you and I would call a zombie. Furthermore, there are evident signs of severe physical deterioration, such as melting skin, exposed bones, and profuse vomiting of blood. Faced with this terrifying transformation, the immediate question that arises is, what the hell is happening here? More importantly, where did this infection originate, and why did it cause such extreme aggression and rapid decomposition in such a short time? In the first key scene, we witness a Parasaurolophus suddenly leaping out of the undergrowth, behaving almost like a rabid animal, and biting a member of the Argentinosaurus herd. What is particularly striking is that this hadrosaur is already in an advanced state of decomposition. Its skin bubbles, its blood seeps out, and its sickly greenish-black coloration suggests it has been infected for some time. How this herbivorous dinosaur initially became contaminated remains unknown, but it is speculated that the virus or pathogenic agent entered its system through an attack from another infected creature. Whatever the origin, the first thing we notice is that transmission occurs through a bite. The infected Parasaurolophus lunges at the Argentinosaurus and sinks its teeth into it, leaving a small but deep wound. From that moment on, the Argentinosaurus becomes infected with the plague and immediately begins to exhibit signs of confusion, weakness, and an insatiable thirst. Shortly afterwards, it vomits large amounts of blood. This bloodied vomiting becomes one of the most terrifying symptoms of the plague, as it not only indicates severe internal damage, but also reveals the infection's lethal speed and devastating effects. The most horrifying aspect, however, is that this bite triggers an uncontrollable murderous instinct in the Argentinosaurus. Within minutes, the infected dinosaur shifts from being a peaceful herbivore to a nightmarish beast that attacks its own herd, slaughtering every adult and hatchling in its path. It doesn't even hesitate before crushing its own species' eggs with a blind, unrelenting fury. To better understand the disease, let's list the symptoms and signs observed in the infected victim the Argentinosaurus in this case. First, there are the severe physical changes in the skin. From the onset of the infection, the afflicted dinosaur undergoes a series of drastic physical transformations. First, its skin takes on a sickly greenish hue, signaling severe internal alterations. Additionally, bubbles or pockets of apparent subcutaneous gas begin to form, suggesting rapid tissue decomposition. As the disease progresses, flesh peels away from the bone exposing large sections of the skeleton. As if that weren't enough, the creature begins to secrete thick fluids of a yellowish or greenish tone dripping from its eyes, snout, and nostrils, further intensifying its grotesque and terrifying appearance. Not only does its body undergo extreme transformations, but its behavior also changes drastically. 
the once peaceful dinosaur turns into a rabid frenzied monster whose only response seems to be sheer violence. It attacks and kills its own kind without any apparent reason or even a feeding motive, reinforcing the idea that it has lost all sense of self-control. Unlike natural predators, which kill out of necessity, this creature shows no signs of satiety or restraint in its violent impulses. Another horrifying symptom of the infection is the constant expulsion of fluids. The dinosaur vomits large amounts of dark red blood, sometimes mixed with greenish fluids, indicating severe internal damage. This symptom suggests a possible massive internal hemorrhage caused by the rapid deterioration of its organs. Additionally, the creature appears to have difficulty breathing, coughing, and expelling more fluids in an endless cycle that worsens its suffering and makes it even more erratic. The effects of the infection are not limited to the body. They also affect the host's nervous system. First, the creature exhibits severe disorientation, causing it to move aimlessly. Additionally, it suffers from uncontrollable muscle spasms, impairing its coordination and making its movements unpredictable. Most alarming is its complete lack of response to pain or defensive stimuli. Even when suffering grave injuries, it continues attacking without hesitation. Its erratic and at times forcibly aggressive movements reinforce the idea that the infection severely affects its brain, completely altering its natural behavior. One of the most striking and terrifying changes in the infected creature's appearance is seen in its eyes. They change color, adopting an unnatural orange or reddish hue. Additionally, its pupils dilate excessively, contributing to its demented and uncontrolled look. The expression in its gaze conveys a mix of uncontrollable rage and an absolute emotional void, as if the creature had lost all sense of self-awareness, becoming nothing more than a tool of destruction. Despite the evident damage to its body, the infected creature demonstrates an extraordinary level of resilience. First, it appears unaffected by normal blows, making any attempt to stop it extremely difficult. Furthermore, even after falling from great heights, it gets back up and continues its rampage as if nothing happened. But the most astonishing aspect is its resistance to extreme temperatures. Within the episode, the creature withstands direct contact with volcanic lava before finally succumbing. This unnatural endurance makes it an unstoppable threat that defies all biological logic. This collection of symptoms resembles a mix between rabies and certain fast-acting bacterial infections, such as gas gangrene. Additionally, its deranged behavior and rapid physical deterioration evoke the concept of a zombie similar to the infected in 28 Days Later. The series never specifies the exact cause of the disease, leaving multiple explanations open. However, the speed at which it spreads and the sheer brutality of its effects strongly resemble a rabies-like virus, with the key difference that in this case, bodily decomposition occurs within minutes, pushing the host into a state of madness and uncontrollable destruction. Many fans have wondered what kind of pathogen could cause something like this. Next, we will explore the different theories proposed by the community and how they could fit into the plague of madness. To begin with, the transmission through bites perfectly fits the hypothesis of a rabies-like virus. Additionally, the extreme aggression and excessive overflow of infected saliva align with the classic symptoms of rabies. However, there is one crucial difference. In real rabies, the incubation period usually takes days or even weeks. In primal, on the other hand, the infection acts within seconds or minutes. This could be explained by a mutated version of the virus, much more virulent and fast-acting, which would justify its rapid spread and immediate effects. On the other hand, some might argue that the disease is caused by a prion, a misfolded protein that destroys brain tissue and leads to strange and erratic behaviors. This hypothesis would explain the madness and rapid loss of control observed in the infected. However, prime diseases usually take much longer to manifest and generally do not cause such drastic physical symptoms in such a short time. Another possibility is that the plague has a bacterial origin. Certain bacteria, such as Clostridium perfringens, produce gas, bubbling, and consume tissues, turning them necrotic in a very short period. This would explain the rapid decomposition of the infected creatures in primal. However, there is a major issue with this theory. Typically, these types of infections do not cause extreme aggression. In fact, most hosts affected by necrotic bacteria become so weak that they die quickly. 
Even so, the liquefaction of flesh observed in the infected aligns well with an extremely aggressive bacterial agent. Finally, there is also the possibility that the plague has a fungal origin. In nature, certain parasitic fungi affect the brains of insects, such as cordyceps in ants, manipulating their behavior to spread spores. In this sense, a similar fungus could be affecting the infected dinosaur's brain, forcing it to act violently and uncontrollably to ensure the pathogens spread. However, transmission through bites is not the most common method in fungal infections, as fungi usually spread through airborne spores. Unless this is an extremely mutated and specialized case, this theory seems less likely compared to the previous ones. Considering the characteristics shown in the primal episode, many viewers and fans agree that a rabies-like virus, or a fictional variant inspired by it, is the most plausible hypothesis. This is due to the infection's ferocity its direct transmission through bites, and the insatiable thirst observed in the infected sauropod. How does the plague of madness spread? The episode suggests that the disease started with a single individual, possibly the infected Parasaurolophus, and is transmitted to any creature that receives a bite or comes into contact with the infected host's bodily fluids. Once the sauropod is fully infected, it completely wipes out its herd. However, there do not appear to be any survivors who get infected as well, since all are annihilated on the spot. This leads to an interesting detail. The plague does not seem to aim for mass reproduction, as the zombie attacks and kills indiscriminately rather than actively spreading the infection. As a result, within the same episode, the contagion does not extend beyond one additional dinosaur, aside from the initial bite that infects the large sauropod. The infected creature does not allow its victims to escape and spread the disease further. Because of this, the outbreak essentially leads to its own self-destruction. After annihilating everything in its path, the sauropod withdraws and enters a dormant state until it detects another threat, in this case, Spear and Fang. In the story, our protagonist, the caveman Spear and the Tyrannosaur Fang, witness the massacre in the dying body of the infected sauropod. What unsettles them the most is realizing that, despite the severity of its wounds and the decomposition of its flesh, the dinosaur rises again and again, driven by rage and a homicidal instinct. Spear in particular suffers nightmares in which he envisions the monster biting them, infecting both him and Fang, horrified as he watches their skin melt away. This emphasizes the terror the plague represents in this universe and the protagonists' complete helplessness against a threat they do not even understand. Later in their attempt to escape, Spear and Fang venture into a volcanic area filled with lava geysers. They believe they can get rid of the sauropod there, as no living being could survive the heat and molten rock. Shockingly, the infected sauropod endures even after falling into the lava. It emerges partially engulfed in flames and continues its rampage. Only in the final moments, when it is literally incinerated into ashes, does the monster finally stop. The episode implies that complete destruction of the body, such as incineration, is the only way to eliminate the infection, as a conventional death would not have stopped it. However, if this were the case, then the Hangisaur might have survived, but this is never confirmed. Thus, the plague of madness serves as a reminder of how fragile life is in such a brutal prehistoric world. Spear and Fang have faced many dangers, but here they encounter something biological in nature that they cannot understand or fight through conventional means. It is an invisible threat that can bring down even the mightiest creatures in a matter of moments. The big question is, what would have happened if the plague had spread to other species? Primal is known for having largely self-contained episodes, with the story being tied together only by the main characters. In other words, we do not see an overarching plotline where the plague becomes a global pandemic. Instead, the show suggests that the infection kills its host and any victims it bites, without leaving survivors to further its spread. However, many fans speculate that if more infected Parasaurolophus had appeared, or if one of the sauropods had bitten another dinosaur without killing it, the epidemic could have escalated much further. In the series, it is striking how Spear, despite his ferocity as a caveman, and Fang, a powerful female Tyrannosaurus, almost always choose to flee from the infected creature rather than confront it directly. Seeing the state of the sauropod and its relentless aggression, 
they understand that a frontal attack could be suicidal. Even when opportunities arise to strike back, the duo prefers to run because they realize that this monstrous sauropod rises undeterred from any injury, as if it feels no pain. In this sense, Plague of Madness highlights the fear that even the apex predators of Primal's world would experience. There is no easy victory against a monster that does not stop, not due to fear, pain, or any instinct of self-preservation. In the end, the monster is gone, but Spear and Fang are left deeply marked by the experience, with a lingering doubt. Is there another infected creature somewhere out there? Could the plague return at some point? This open-ended conclusion fuels the curiosity of the show's fans, as the series never explicitly revisits this disease in later episodes. However, many viewers speculate that the virus, or whatever it may be, could have survived in the environment or within scavenger animals. To wrap up this video, we can conclude that the Plague of Madness stands out as one of the most terrifying and original depictions of a zombie infection in recent animation. What do you think about the Plague of Madness? Do you believe it's more of a rabies-like virus or a bacterial pathogen? Would you have liked to see a larger story arc with multiple infected dinosaurs expanding the apocalypse within the world of Primal? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Personally, I consider it one of the best horror sequences the animated series has delivered in recent years. Thank you so much for watching until the end. If you enjoyed this content, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. See you next time. Hey, don't go just yet. If you enjoyed my video, I'd love to recommend another one for you to watch.